Five years ago, in March of 1946, in the Beekman Hotel in New York City, a group of people came together to share some common interests and to advance science around control and communication. They called this the Macy Conference for Circular Causality and Feedback in the Biological and Social Sciences. <sighs> And this was a multidisciplinary group of scientists. Uh, so you have some biologists and some anthropologists, but also like neurophysiologists, uh, Warren McCullough here and, and Walter Pitts, who is also there. Uh, they, they're the first people who worked in artificial intelligence. Uh, you've got physicists and a lot of mathematicians. Claude Shannon here is known for information theory. All kinds of really interesting people who had some interesting ideas that coincided and that they were really excited to talk about. Because this is right after World War II. And during the war, all of these scientists were engaged in activities to help the Allies win. So the, the anthropologists are working on propaganda and like morale and, and um, psychological warfare, while information theory is working on the noise and the radar and cryptography, of course, and the electronic computer is being used to, to calculate things and to do cryptography. And so everyone was very busy. Um, and now it's 1946. The war is over, we get to take what we've been learning over these years and apply it to the study of life instead of death. For instance, uh, Norbert Wiener was one of the organizers of this group. And uh, during the war, he worked on surface-to-air missiles. So surface-to-air missiles, they're trying to shoot planes out of the sky before the planes can bomb the city. And this is really hard. These missiles are super inaccurate. But we have the new tool of radar. Now, it's very early radar, so there's a lot of noise uh, in the signal, but they can get something. So they can see kind of where the plane is and make a guess about where it's going to be and then aim the, the, the missile and fire it. But then the important part is that with the radar, they can also see what happened. They can see where the missile actually went, where the plane actually went. And then they can, they can take that and compare it to their expectations and use that information to fire the next missile. So they have a better idea of the behavior of the gun, maybe the planes and the wind and stuff like that. So Norbert Wiener noticed that, that now we've got this loop going on um, and, and we can see and we can act and then we can adjust our next action. And he realized that this is a lot like a sensory motor loops in humans, like the perception action loop by, by which we do things. So like when I reach for this glass of water, I don't look at the water on the table decide what to do, and then move. I would totally knock it over. I, I gradually um, watch my hand and watch the glass, and then I feel the glass, and then I'm constantly adjusting uh, my motions to match what I see. And then it works. Uh, so this is, this, this is what Wiener and several of the others brought to the Macy Conferences on Circular Causa cybernetics. They renamed it to the Macy Conferences on Cybernetics, or Control and Communication in the Animal and Machine. Uh, because, because they saw these kind of loops. Uh, Walter Pitt saw it in, in neuron firing, which worked into how computer memory works now, and uh, lots of other places. And they're like, oh, this has got to help in the social sciences too. Let's bring the social sciences in with this. And indeed, uh, some of the social scientists had been noticing similar mechanisms. Uh, I want to talk about two of the people who were at this meeting today, one mathematician, one anthropologist, and contrast their ways of using these ideas, because both are extremely relevant to software today, and we're really good at one of them. 
First, John von Neumann. Uh, John von Neumann was born in Hungary in 1903 to a good family. He had private tutors and good schools and and lots of friends, but he was a ridiculous child prodigy. Uh, Like by eight, he's doing calculus. By 15, he's at the University of Berlin, um, frightening his math professors because they like mention some theorem that hasn't been proved yet. And by the end of class, he turns in a proof. Um, John von Neumann is probably the greatest rational mind, the smartest person ever recognized in the world. Like, he worked down the hall from Einstein at Princeton, but he did, they didn't collaborate much because Einstein was just too slow. Von Neumann was amazing. He contributed to rather a lot of fields. Well, a lot of these he started. He started game theory. He started, um, well, He worked on information theory and, oh, quantum physics, because I think he was 21 when he he created the mathematical framework that underlies uh, quantum mechanics and and unified the work of Heisenberg and Schrodinger and showed that they were really both special cases of his formulation using Hilbert spaces in infinite dimensions, obviously. By 27, he's a full professor at Princeton. Um, And von Neumann, I mean, he was just brilliant and just like knocked it out of the park with everything he looked at and learned. And and, like, he was also a nice guy. People liked him. He had good charisma. Oh, he liked parties and going to jazz clubs. He was also really fun. Von Neumann, The road to success was a many-laned highway with little traffic, which is good because he was a terrible driver. He was known for like wrecking a car every year and and people were always having to get him out of tickets. Uh, But yeah, he he was a lot of fun. Um, During the war, he worked on the Manhattan Project where they built the atomic bombs. He worked in the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, You might know, in my computer architecture class in college, I heard of von Neumann um, related to the von Neumann computer architecture because he had huge contributions to early computers. He worked on the ENIAC and improved it and a bunch of earlier ones. He he, uh, built a computer at Princeton. Uh, But the von Neumann architecture is the one where he had the bright idea, he and some others, to put the program in memory along with the data. Because before that, they used to program computers by like moving wires around and it took weeks. And von Neumann was like, okay, if we make it work like this, we can put the program as input and then run it on the data. And that was massively more efficient. Um, the, The von Neumann architecture was super important to hardware, But von Neumann had a deeper insight about computers because he realized that computing was first a logic problem where everyone else was thinking about it as engineering, a problem of hooking the vacuum tubes together. Uh, But in this sense, he was the first computer scientist uh, or a first computer scientist. However, I do think he was the computer scientist because he also invented the merge sort algorithm, which means he, he's the first person who could ever pass the interview. Among other things, von Neumann created game theory. And game theory um, is a bunch of math behind the playing of hypothetical games. Uh, for instance, this started with the, the Minimax theorem that he proved something about the, if you have a zero, no, a two person, zero sum, perfect information game, um, then you can prove something about the, how to minimize your maximum losses. Yeah, yeah. He did all of this with great rigor in mathematics. Von Neumann was all about the logic. And he solved a lot of people's problems this way. 
Oh, at the, at the Macy conferences, he was there to learn about brains so that he could pl apply that to computers. He was super into cellular automata, among a million other things. Um, and at the Macy conference on cybernetics was the first time that von Neumann met Gregory Bateson. Uh, Gregory Bateson was about six months younger than von Neumann, but he was born in England, also to a good family. His father, William Bateson, was a biologist who coined the term genetics. So Gregory had a lot of pressure to go toward biology, and he did study zoology for a while in college, but then he went into anthropology and studied people. Meanwhile, he had influence on a lot of fields. He made contributions to psychology, ecology, um, of course, a lot to anthropology, uh, and he, uh, he influenced a lot of people, but he was at the Macy conferences because he wanted more rigor in the social sciences. He saw a lot of people like gathering data and then making up stories about it and calling that a theory. And he's like, no, we need to start with theory. We need better theories. And then we can work from there and gather data and look for, for contradictions and learn stuff. Um, he brought to the conference his experience with anthropology. So uh, here he is with Margaret Mead in, well, I'm going to talk about his experience in IATML. Um, so before World War II, he went to New Guinea and he studies tribes because he's an anthropologist. And he noticed in this IATML tribe um, a concept that he dubbed schismogenesis, which was where uh, division uh, brewed within the tribe. And people gradually got like further and further apart and, and more opposed and angry at each other. But then the tribe had mechanisms to balance this. Uh, they, they had ceremonies that would get everyone goofing around and draw them back together. Uh, and he used this concept of schismogenesis, of dividing tribes, of uh, a division that like reinforces itself during the war. Uh, where he was working on propaganda for the Allies. But Bateson was interested in communication and learning and ways of knowing throughout people and animals and nature. Uh, one year he had a dozen octopuses in his living room as he's studying the ways they communicate. Where von Neumann studied information theory Bateson studied communication and meaning. Uh, where von Neumann studied game theory, Bateson was interested in play. So one time he goes to the zoo and he's watching the monkeys and they're like chawing on each other. And he notices that like this same message, the same action of biting the other monkey uh, can have two different meanings. It can be aggression, it can be fighting, or it, it can be friendly, it can be play. And the, the distinguishing factor between that isn't in the bite itself, it's in the surrounding context, it's in the meta-message. So Bateson talks about meta-messages as layers of communication. I've noticed that in, in, when, I, when I talk to my partner, there are, there's a lot of times when, yes, there's some content to the conversation, but really, Really, it's about our relationship. It's about, are we okay with each other? Uh, and I think a lot of times, uh, the, the, the meta message of how are we with each other is stronger than the content of the message. Like for instance, in pull requests, maybe there's a pull request and there's a comment on it. <sighs> we don't use single quotes here. Please change it to double quotes or the other way around. It doesn't matter. Yes, okay, there's some content about quotes, but what is the meta message here? It's pro <laughs> it looks to me like the meta message is you don't belong here or you would already know that. Or maybe it's I'm gonna make you do this pathetic, useless work that a machine could do instead of whatever else you are actually thinking about. I mean, or it could be that these two people have been working there for five years and they're just giving each other crap. You can't tell that from outside. You wouldn't guess that from outside. And the meta message here is one 
of, um, of nagging each other within the team, which is kind of sad. Here's another one from software itself. Say we have a client and it's talking to a server over some specific protocol, but there's more to the message than the content. For instance, in this case, it gets back an error. And the client responds to that by like, no, 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 don't retry, retry. And that, that seems reasonable, a reasonable response to the content of that error message. But if you think about the system a little wider, maybe you'll realize that the server, okay, it got that initial error, it had some hiccup. Um, so it was having a bit of a hard time. And then you just slammed it with retries, and now it's going down. Dope. So when you think about the system more broadly, about the meta message inside that error message, which is, ah, I'm having a little trouble here, then as a client, you might consider exponential back off. You'd be like, oh, uh, we got an error. OK, we'll give it a second and then retry. Uh, oh, I'm still nothing? Give it five seconds and then retry. Give it 30 seconds for the third retry. And that's a lot better. Uh, until you realize that you're not the only client. And a bunch of clients with the same code base are also retrying. They all, got, they all got the hiccup, and they're retrying at exactly one second and exactly five seconds and exactly 30 seconds, and the poor server is just slammed. This, this phenomenon is called the thundering herd of, of you get one blip, and then you're just slammed with retries until you go down. And when we consider the system at this level, it's including multiple clients and the poor little server there, we might consider implementing exponential back off with jitter. And that means that after we get the initial error message, we wait one second, eh, plus or minus half a second. And then we wait five seconds, eh, plus or minus a second, and 30 seconds, plus or minus five. We give it some space so that not all the clients are um, are hitting it at the same time. We're using randomness to our advantage here, which is fun. And, and this is much better. This, this does help with the thundering herd and gives the server a chance to recover. OK, so that's cool. One thing that's neat about this one, um, to implement that, that exponential back off with jitter, we used math. And we can test this function and make sure it's correct. But to know we needed to do that, we had to widen our perspective and use systems thinking. Uh, the Macy Conference is on cybernetics. Cybernetics was uh, the, the word that Norbert Wiener coined, and we don't use it much anymore. It's pretty much evolved into systems thinking and a couple different branches. But, but the important thing is thinking about a wider scale than what's right in front of us. Now, this, this part right in front of us, this, this lovely piece of math here, we can write this using functional programming. And functional programming, uh, as a paradigm, is all about keeping as much of your program as possible and as many decisions as you can inside uh, code that is entirely logical, doesn't touch anything in the outside world, it's completely predictable. Even when you're using randomness, you can check the range. Um, and we can test it. So like von Neumann, functional programming is all about expanding the range of what we can use logic for. Formulate it in logic and then solve it. This is totally essential to software development. We have to be able to reason about what the code is going to do, what the software is going to do, um, and what the heck it's doing when we're trying to debug it. But then at some point, we've got to put that nice little functional piece of code into production. And it's going to have some state coming in. And it's going to have some effects on the world going out. It's going to hit other servers. It's going to talk to the database. And somewhere in there, it's going to interact with a person, because otherwise, it's not being useful. And once, once the person gets in there, a lot of that predictability goes away. But also, that's where we get the usefulness. Bateson recognized that the computer is an arc of a larger circuit, which always includes a person who's providing input and then receiving efferent messages, that means outgoing messages, um, from the computer have effect. 
So there's always a person in the loop, and we can think about that person, and we can consider, um, okay, we can consider everything that could happen, including these errors. So when we get an error from the server, how does our client display this to the user? Do we tell them, do we tell them 500? Failure, can't load the page? Do we, do we pop up an error message that says try again later? And if so, do we make it a modal that blocks the entire web page? Or do we just let this one piece of the web page not quite work yet and say loading? Um, if it's a validation error, can we tell the person what to do next? I love Elm and Elixir as programming languages because the authors of these languages Evan and Jose, if you get a compiler message and you, a compiler error, and you don't know what to do next, they consider that a bug in the compiler. Software that guides people, uh, either developers that are calling into it or uh, humans that are using it, guides us back to the happy path is immensely more useful. That's the difference between good software and frustrating software. Of course, there's always going to be some errors that you have no idea how to handle and you just do not expect. Uh, you do not expect them to ever happen in production. And so, okay, maybe I can't come up with a useful error message for that. But in that case, I'm going to ask, all right, if this does happen in production, how am I going to find out? <laughs> We're going to consider what actually did happen. And this is, this is a systems thinking kind of thing of recognizing, I, I, I think this will never happen, but if it does, I want to find out so that I can learn something. Because maybe that full screen error modal is hitting 20% of your customers and you don't know about it because the only way you'll ever find out is if that customer calls a phone number and talks to a rep and if enough of them do that, then maybe someday it'll make it back through product ownership and someday maybe it'll be in a requirement for the development team to do something about it. Okay, big companies, it happens. Anyway, <laughs> consider what did happen and how you'll find out about it. Can we not go through that whole loop? Can we make our code produce an error message that gets directly to us? So von Neumann is all about the logic, which is essential for programming. But don't forget to start with what you think is gonna happen and then compare that to what actually does. So Bateson, for instance, he worked with schizophrenics. He worked in a psychology group at the VA in Palo Alto, and um, they were studying some schizophrenic patients. And of course, the generic psychologist is like, oh, something is wrong with them. Maybe it's genetic. And Bateson's like, what, what, what if we start with the theory that they are responding reasonably to the inputs to they, have, they have, to the systems that they are in. And he looked at their, their situations, their circumstances, their families. Well, Bateson and his group created the concept of family therapy, the radical idea that if we want to be psychologically healthy, our relationships matter. Um, but with the, with the schizophrenics in particular, he noticed that there were some commonalities to a lot of their uh, current situations or past situations. And uh, his group came up with the concept of the double bind. The double bind is when you're in an impossible situation, you're in a relationship that's important to you and you can't leave, but it, you're getting contradictory messages at different like levels of communication. So like this is the, the mother that says that I, I love you, but always turns away and doesn't provide any affection. And the kid, like, they can't talk about it because they're a kid, and they can't do anything about it because they're a kid. But, and so they have this really important person that they're trying to please and they just can't. And this level of confusion maybe contributes, um, this level of, con this situation contributes to confusion that's actually quite a reasonable response. Or here's a double bind. It might be your boss thanks you for doing all this coordination work that helps out the whole team and keeps everyone moving smoothly. Oh, but on your annual performance review, I can't give you a good rating because you're not personally closing enough tickets. 
what's this person supposed to do? They can't both do this essential coordination work that helps the whole team and churn out tickets at the rate of everybody else. And then their boss is like, oh, with this performance review, you're lucky to have a job here. They're trapped. This authority figure is telling them contradictory messages. They can't get it right. They can't leave. This is a double bind. This has been a very useful concept in psychology and in psychological treatment. And Bateson noticed this because he, doesn't, he starts with the theory and then looks for what else happens. In our work, it's very important to start with logic. The, the logic part is essential. We can't not be good at it as developers. And we develop these skills, but we can go farther. So you start as a dev, and your job is to implement requirements, right? You, you get told what to do, and you, you solve the puzzle, and you make the code do that, and then you deliver it to test, right? You, you commit it. You push it. And it's easy to think of this as our job. But that, this by itself is not useful in the world. To be useful in the world, we need like this whole circle of, yeah, we change some code and then we deploy it and uh, some, some people or some software interact with it. Um, and then if we want to learn anything and get better, somewhere there's a loop of, okay, now the software is working like this and okay, well, now we think it could be better like this and someone somewhere gives you more work to do. Also, as a side effect of this loop, somebody's making money and paying you. As software developers, I think as we grow from junior to senior level, we start thinking about more of this loop. We start looking for the feedback loop that we can actually learn from to make our software better. And, and this might currently go through a bunch of product owners, but there are ways that we can teach our code to tell us what's going on and shorten this loop and learn faster. And when we do this, we can get to something better than correct. Because like in, in, the, in the example of the thundering herd, there's like that middle, little math function. Logic can help us get the code correct, but it takes broadening. It takes systems thinking to know what correct is. And this is, we can learn more and more, not just what we think correct is, but what can actually be better. We can practice gradual, deliberate improvement. And we can get to a place that's better than our first idea of correct ever would have been. And this is, this is the same feedback loop that Norbert Wiener had with his airplanes, right? Why did you shoot, uh, what, or how were you able to hit that plane with that missile? Um, well, we, we knew to aim it that way because last time we aimed it this way, it did this, and the plane was going here, and, and we knew that we tried that one because the time before that, we learned this other thing, and so on and so on. This feedback loop is one of the essential themes of the conference, and it's a form of circular causality. So circular causality is a funny thing, and this is what distinguishes system science from all the sciences that came before it, is the recognition of circular causality. Because since Aristotle, we have had the idea that nothing can cause itself. Aristotle forbade self-cause. And since then, we've tied ourselves in knots, trying to uh, refuse to acknowledge self-causality, uh, self circular causality. And we want everything to, to boil down to atoms smashing into each other like billiard balls, but it doesn't work that way. And you can see it all around you in the biological and social sciences especially. So like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Why is this a paradox? Chickens cause eggs, cause chickens cause eggs, and that's why we still have chickens and eggs. This is actually very normal, but because we refuse to think about circular causality, we get stuck on which was first. Yes, okay, at some point there was a dinosaur, and at some point we decided, okay, now it's a chicken. Well, we didn't decide that, we retroactively decide that. But still, this is like the trivial example of circular causality. There's a lot more. Uh, take real estate bubbles. 
um, the prices go up, and the more prices go up, the faster prices go up, the more people want in, which of course drives up prices, and, and things get bigger and bigger. Um, Facebook has a, a network effect, which is, uh, which is one of these reinforcing loops. As, as more people use Facebook, it gets more useful, which means more people use Facebook, and so it gets more useful, and so on. And any like article that you might post on Facebook, the more mad it makes you, the more you share it, and the more people get mad, and the more people share it. <sighs> uh, these reinforcing loops happen in small ways. So it's helped me to notice that my feelings are often uh, self-causing, like, if I'm mad, then when I get that 500 error, I get really frustrated and I get more mad. Whereas yesterday I was actually in quite a good mood and I got a 500 that, that on a buy button, it was like, well, that's a bad error. And I went in and I looked at the network tab and it actually had a location in there as if it were a redirect and I went to that location and it worked. That's funny because I was in a good mood. But if I weren't and I really wanted to buy that thing, I'd have been pissed. Um, and then when we're mad, we, we get grouchy with each other. Suddenly it seems like everyone sucks and they, they don't even know what they're doing and they're not paying attention and, and we just get grouchy with each other and, and that reinforces too. It becomes a vicious cycle. Um, I see this in, um, it, well, in software, for instance, the thundering herd is itself a feedback loop. Failure leads to too many retries, leads to more failure. Uh, we hit these a lot when we don't expect it. Maybe you have a team that is really good um, and they trust each other and so they share information and they work together and so their code is really pretty and so they're happy and so they're nice to each other. And a good team can become great in this way over time. Or you can have a team very, just down the hall that doesn't trust each other and they're always blaming each other for all the problems that they have in production, which are bugs at the interfaces because they're not collaborating on their code and they're building up silos and so their code gets messy, so they have more bugs and more pressure and it just gets worse. And maybe all of that started with a few thoughtless pull request comments. The reason I got mad in the first place was, I don't know, some random annoyance, but it spirals. Um, now, these things can work both ways. In the team, it works both ways. You might, if you took a developer out of that, that grouchy team and moved them into the happy team, you might, you might get a completely different developer. Be like, I thought they weren't any good, but actually, it's the situation. Because these things uh, reinforce each other. But the good part is about these reinforcing loops that you can run them in the other direction once you notice them. For instance, Oh, oh, here's another one. Uh, the nuclear bomb is a reinforcing loop um, because you get one fission, it outputs two neutrons or so, and if any of those hit another uranium atom, boom, you get another two neutrons, and then you get an explosion. Um, here's another software one. Uh, you say you have a couple bad deploys, and people start to get paranoid and are like, deploys are bad, we need to put in more checks. More checks make the deploys slower. Slower deploys, you haven't changed your rate of making changes to the software, so now there's more changes in each deploy and they're bigger and so they're even more likely to fail. And so you get this fear cycle going. And this is something that if you, Jez and team discovered, if you add a lot of effort for automation and a little bit of bravery, you can turn this around and make the deploys faster, which makes them happen more often, which makes them safer, which reduces fear, and so on, and we call this DevOps. So systems thinking to zoom out until you find this reinforcing loop. Like whenever you see something that's like, that doesn't even make sense. Why would they believe that? Well, it's because they're convincing each other of it by passing their maddening articles around on Facebook. Um, whenever you find something that doesn't make sense, like a real estate bubble, uh, zoom out and look for a reinforcing loop. Every startup wants to find a reinforcing loop of hypergrowth, but really these, these are rare. 
and rarely healthy. And much more common is the balancing loop, or Kent Beck calls this one the inhibiting loop because it inhibits change. And the balancing loop, these are what holds the world together. These are what keeps things the same. Uh, so that, that code review that reminds people of our code style, that's a balancing loop, or maybe a nicer code review that, that actually helps the code be less messy. Um, but if I realize that I just made a rude pull request comment, and that probably hurt someone's feelings, and I apologize, that's a balancing loop that can stop me from getting into the spiral of a team of distrust and move us uh, toward keeping our trust with each other. It's a balancing loop um, when, uh, in, when we put a control rod into a nuclear reactor. So you've got the nuclear fission happening, but in a power reactor, we don't want the big explosion. We want to keep it at a certain temperature. So we react to it getting really hot by putting in control rods, absorbs the neutrons, restores the level that we want it at. Thermostat, classic balancing loop. Um, the, the jitter and the exponential back off, balancing loop. Oh, uh, Kubernetes, uh, when your service dies and Kubernetes restarts it, this is a balancing loop. It restores the state that we're trying to keep. Um, the, the missiles uh, form a balancing loop, Norbert Wiener's missiles. Um, because we're getting better and better, we're getting narrower and narrower in on the specific state that we want. In our code, uh, the tiniest balancing loop is a unit test because it prevents change uh, when we run it in an automated fashion and respond when it turns red. Uh, the test turns red, we react by um, fixing the code or changing the test so that the state of, of code works as tested is restored. Now, um, to do that, our code doesn't do that by itself. Even all of our automations don't keep our software up forever. And they don't keep, they don't keep it getting closer and closer to useful to what we want. That takes us. So I think of us as people as part of the software system. I mean, one thing about systems, the boundaries are all arbitrary. We drew them for our own purposes, and, and we can draw them where they're useful to us. And often, that's not where we, often you can find new ways to think about system, your system, and new things to do about it when you shift those boundaries. So for instance, if I look at the running software as my team's job, but I keep the people in the system with that, then I can form feedback loops with uh, the software teaching the people about what's happening, what errors did happen in production, what is the code doing now? And of course, the people teach the software because we change it. We add those unit tests, we add those signals in for us, um, and we improve it. And so the, the people and the software form a system. This system can do more than deliver features. This system can keep capabilities running for the whole business so that the whole business can do new things. Now, this particular system is an instance of a semathesy. This is a word coined by Nora Bateson, Gregory Bateson's daughter, also an anthropologist. And a semathesy is a learning system made of learning parts. You're never going to be able to apply perfect logic or prediction to a semathesy. But instead, you get possibilities that you never could have thought of before. This, this is hard. It's harder than writing code. It's harder than just understanding logic. When I went into programming um, in college, I loved how predictable it was. Um, because before that, like in my physics classes, uh, we got to quantum mechanics and it kind of lost its charm because I couldn't predict it anymore. But I could with the code. Of course, now, after 20 years of software development, what I love about it is that it's not fully predictable, that we can discover things, that we can grow and learn. And I think our progression as a software engineer from junior to senior and then to staff to principal is this widening of what we care about. 
You can have all the passion in the world for writing code. And you know what that will get you? Code. Is it the right code? Is it useful code? Probably not. Because what gets us to useful code that really helps people isn't passion about some narrow thing. It's caring about the wider system and everything else that happens. So I think as we advance in our careers, we can get better at the systems thinking and at caring about wider and wider systems. Caring about the systems adjacent to our software and the people who work on those systems and the people who use them and so on and so on. And this gets painful and unsatisfying because you don't control all of this. You can control your little piece of code and your little unit test in that tiny little feedback loop. I love that one. But you can't control the adjacent teams. Um, so that's painful. But the biggest thing about systems thinking is realizing that every system is a subsystem and expanding outward. Expanding outward um, to think about the other clients in the server as well as the client you're writing right now. Expanding outward to your adjacent software teams and realizing that you can influence them with relationships. Not, it's not about the content of the message, man. It's not about your intent. It's about the meta message and the relationship that it's in. That's how we influence people and make change. And in any uh, engineering career ladder, once you get up to the level of staff or principal or architect, influence on the wider organization is a big, uh, big line item there. So is influence on the community, the community of the libraries and the runtime that we're totally dependent on but do not control. You get some of that at conferences when you meet other people. So in systems thinking, we, we give up the idea that we have complete control over our nice little piece of math here, but we gain influence. We're never in complete control and neither are we helpless. But this, um, this means that as software developers, we, we, all, we have to think about the wider system and at some point, we actually have to write code, right? We have to zoom in and think about what to type next. And this, I find this like sometimes mentally painful. I think this is one of the challenges, the core challenges of software development is this zooming in and out of what to type next, what is correct. Oh, well, let's, what would be correct here? Let's think about the wider system. Um, do we want to spend this time on that? Let's think about the wider system still. Who should we ask? This zooming in and out is one of the core skills that I've developed over time and over experience. Von Neumann was a whiz at this. He was amazingly good. In his work with computers, he moved continuously back and forth between this highly formal automata theory, the, the brain neurophysiology, engineering characteristics, and the politics and financing. Von Neumann was good at politics as well as math, amazing. And this, this mattered, he got a lot done. And as a result, 76 years ago, in August of 1945, the US dropped two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and 200,000 people died. Not right away, only half died that first day, the rest of them straggled into hospitals over the weeks and months with their skin red and vomiting, their insides dissolving of radiation sickness. The hospitals couldn't do anything for them. Before World War II, scientists could pretend that their work was apolitical. But in World War II, they took sides. They saw that if Hitler won the war, science would be set back by at least a century. The worst case was Hitler getting the atomic bomb. So the scientists, everyone who could get away, um, came to the US and they worked for the Allies. As an American, our experience of World War II is very different from Poland's. There was a lot of science going on. Um, and that swayed the war, I mean, 
World War II was totally won in large part by allied science. And after the war, after the bombs were dropped, uh, the scientists of the Manhattan Project, <laughs> they, they weren't happy about that result. And they formed societies uh, to advance disarmament, to push for never using atomic weapons again. Except for von Neumann. Von Neumann did not join. After the war, he insisted that, no, no, my only public involvement is a purely technical nature. I never talk about politics. Which is because he was very involved in politics. In the Manhattan Project, von Neumann got to work with these high-powered military men, and he liked them. He liked men of power. He liked being in those circles. Von Neumann was in love with the aristocracy of the intellect. And he liked his positions of power. So after World War II, he remained a very high-level advisor to the military. He advised a bunch of companies who paid him to uh, solve their hard problems. Um, and the year before he died, he was appointed to the Atomic Energy Commission, which had the power of God for anything involving nukes. He did, he did well. But he, um, he was not against using the atomic bomb. Quite the opposite. He was actually all for it. He advanced computers tremendously in order to do the calculations to construct a hydrogen bomb because the plutonium bombs just weren't big enough. He was a big part of the Cold War, a big part of the US and the Soviet Union racing to build enough bombs to destroy the world several times over. Von Neumann came up with the concept of mutually assured destruction out of game theory. And he was for it. How this is minimizing our maximum losses, I don't understand. But von Neumann is quoted as saying he was for a preemptive strike. He was like, Oh, if you say bomb the Russians on tomorrow, I say, why not today? If you say bomb them at five o'clock, I say, why not one o'clock? This is the greatest rational mind the world has ever known. I don't think rationality is enough to keep us alive. And he, this was totally rational from his perspective. He saw the Soviet Union as unambiguously and unalterably our dangerous enemy. Can't be anything else. Bateson wrote in a letter to Weiner, applications of the theory of games reinforce the player's perceptions, their, exception, their acceptance of the rules, and their premise that human nature is unchangeable. By abstracting things into math and finding that math incredibly useful, we have all kinds of success with the math, and, and so we fall in love with the success and we think it's actually working, and we forget all the assumptions that went into it. We forget that everything else that humans can be. Bateson knew better as an anthropologist. He knew that the rules of culture are not fixed that among humans there are always possibilities that we could enumerate. That in these psychological games, reinforcing loops are the rule um, between people, and we can run them both ways. In game theory, on the other hand, von Neumann's players are totally unable to play. It's through play that we find the possibilities, the other options, that everything else besides the rules that were laid out for us. As software developers, we have an unparalleled ability to play in complex socio-technical systems. So for our jobs to do good work with software, we absolutely need to be able to do reasoning and logic, not to von Neumann's level, but we need to be good enough. But also, it benefits us 
to widen our thinking and to think about, care about everything else than to do systems thinking. But the beauty is we have more opportunity than anyone else to get good at systems thinking because we have these systems that are made of code and we can change code faster than anybody can change a bridge or a law or a person. We can change the complex systems that we work in. We can make them teach us. In biology, it's immensely slower. We try to like inject genes into plants and we have to put these marker genes in there and, and hope that they glow under black light and, just, and, and take generations to, to do an experiment. In a web app, an experiment could take days or weeks. We have the opportunity to learn because we have the most malleable systems medium that people have ever had access to and we can make it teach us. That's why I think as developers, uh, we have the hope of finding new ways to think about systems. We can advance Bateson's projects. Bateson cared about learning, communication, ways of knowing, and he was always seeking new ways to talk about systems. Because as people, now that we have all this technology, we can do new things faster than ever, which means we need new ways to think about these things. And that's what we can develop when we get good at systems thinking. And we need that. We need new ways of thinking that have a broader scope, that go farther out in time, that care about more than what's right in front of us. Because winning is not the point. Winning doesn't help us here. The creature that wins against its environment destroys itself. And in man versus nature, man, we are kicking nature's butt. Sort of, I don't, I, this is not a winning game for us. Because you know what's better than winning? Continuing to play. Continuing to play in life, just like in software. We want the software to continue to run. We want to continue to improve it. We want to keep playing. So science and technology are never apolitical. Pretending that it is serves the existing power structure, which can make you some money. But it is not the business of science to inherit the earth, money, but to inherit the moral imagination. Because without that, man and our beliefs and all of our knowledge and our computers will perish together. Now, our work is not political, or it's not apolitical, it, it is political. But I'm not telling you that you should like anticipate every consequence, everyone who's going to use this program that you're writing. We can't do that, we don't control that. Heck, the scientists in the Manhattan Project didn't know about radiation sickness. You can tell because when they tested the atomic bomb, they watched it and then they walked up to stand on the glass that used to be sand right under the bomb site. And yes, 12 years later, von Neumann died of cancer. We can't know that stuff, but we can care. We can look for ways to make people, make people a little better off. So we can care about security. We can look for potential for abuse and act on that. For the love of God, write better error messages. It'll make everyone happier, including you in the long term. As software developers, I hope we can play with systems. We can learn about systems. We can be better systems thinkers. And then we can apply this to life and the world. And if we do, I hope that for our descendants, we can make this an even better place to live 75 years from now. Thank you. Uh, you can find references, whoops. Um, you can find references for this talk at systemsthinking.dev. And uh, I think he said we have a half hour break after this. 
So I'll see you at coffee.